Hello everyone, uh, Bob Sampson is my name. I'm the Executive Officer for the National Railway Museum down here at Port Adelaide. We hope you enjoy the story. There is something like 100 different exhibits here at the Railway Museum and uh, some of my favourites include um, uh, diesel number 900, Lady Norrie. Uh, that was designed and built at the Islington Railway Workshops and was the first uh, mainline diesel to enter service in Australia in 1951. So it's certainly a very, very important exhibit here at the museum and uh, it stands very proud uh, at our station. Uh, inside the main display pavilion. The other exhibit uh, I'm f f quite uh, um, uh, awestruck with is uh, the Garrett uh, number 409 and this uh, steam locomotive uh, was built in 1952 so it's not even as old as the oldest uh, diesel but in fact it's built in France and there's very few steam locomotives uh, preserved uh, outside of Europe that were built in France but it was built under license uh, from Bayer Peacock in Britain when it just had that much work on it couldn't do it all so it, it contracted it out to a locomotive manufacturing company uh, in France and they built 10 of these uh, Garrett locomotives they're narrow gauge and they operated between Port Pirie and Broken Hill quite odd looking locomotive was it has two engines and one boiler, that is two uh, sets of uh, power traction wheels and the one boiler slung in between the water tank and the uh, oil tank. So this is a break of gauge station. It's what we call uh, uh, where two different gauges meet. Uh, on my right is the narrow gauge, very common throughout South Australia. And on my left is the broad gauge. And our recreated break of gauge station is an example of, of several that existed around South Australia where the different railway gauges come together. So what it meant was all the passengers had to get off one train, change over the platform and get onto the other train and vice versa. Parcels and luggage and everything also had to be physically transferred from one train to the other. So people get a, a, a genuine appreciation of, of the complete different sizes, uh, the architectural design of the engines and carriages, it's all very, very familiar uh, in real life and uh, it's a good experience and an education point for, uh, for people doing social studies and the history of South Australia. We believe the museum is a very important component of uh, understanding about the history of South Australia because of the nature of the development of the state and the regional areas. Um, prior to roadways and railways, of course, in a, in a big way, uh, the state had several coastal ports and those ports were all connected to rail lines that went into the uh, agriculture areas, bringing back uh, uh, wool and grains that would then be loaded onto coastal shipping to take them from point to point. So prior to any road network, Railways and shipping was a major connection in South Australia. Sleeping car example on the Brogan Hill Express on my right and on my left, an overland sleeping car, uh, a Lambie that would run between Adelaide and Melbourne from the 1950s right through to the 1980s. Um, this carriage is the uh, oldest preserved passenger carriage in uh, South Australia. It dates back to 1877 and was used on the narrow gauge system um, uh, around South Australia. This carriage is used a lot by film crews and uh, photo shoots purely because of its, uh, its different appearance and also uh, uh, its, its age. It's, uh, as I said, quite an old uh, vehicle parallel timber seating. Uh, you can imagine people traveling in this uh, for several hours at a time. It was uh, pretty rough and ready, but that's what you had to expect back then. If you were going to do regional uh, train travel 120 odd years ago, 
This is a typical, typical sort of carriage you would have ridden in. Uh, more collection, of course, we have uh, various steam locomotives from, again, around the narrow gauge system. Uh, these operated, again, between mainly Port Pirie and uh, uh, Peterborough, and also the lines from Gladstone to Wilmington and Peterborough to Quorn. Onga Pringa is a magnificent uh, sleeping carriage off the Melbourne Express, or the Overland, as it became later on. Uh, it's a, a 19... Uh, 11 built uh, timber body sleeping car. There's very few in existence of these left and the museum spent several thousands of dollars on restoring this carriage to bring it back to an absolute uh, a gem of a carriage. It's, it's made up as a uh, combination of uh, sit-up uh, compartments as well as sleeping compartments so people can understand the difference between the carriage when it was at uh, daytime or at night time. Um, it's a joint stock vehicle, that is, it's, it was run by the Victorian and South Australian Railways uh, and it was quite common for uh, uh, train consists, that's a set of carriages being made up all from jointly owned carriages to share costs and maintenance between uh, the train operations of Adelaide and Melbourne. The tea and sugar train uh, is a wonderful uh, icon uh, and we're so happy to have uh, four genuine carriages from the famous tea and sugar train which ran across the Nullarbor uh, uh, between Port Augusta and Kalgoorlie for um, decades. And it took food and produce and medical needs and all sorts of uh, requirements uh, for all those remote uh, communities living, uh, as I said, across the Nullarbor. So the, the once a week arrival of the tea and sugar train was very, very important. So it's important that we have a continual supply of uh, new volunteers. So if you're interested in helping out with the museum in any way whatsoever, uh, please make contact with the museum and talk through how you might be able to help out because there's a wide variety of jobs to do and we always look out for extra people. And volunteers, as I've already said today, are so important to the museum. We've got about 120 regular volunteers, and this is uh, commonly called the carpenter team, and they do anything mainly with uh, timber. <laughs> but no, all good, and uh, as I said, without the volunteers, we haven't, we haven't got any projects we can do. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jeff, Ken, and Con are just three of uh, many of the volunteers we've got doing different jobs around the museum. Um, two wonderful carriages in the collection are both off the Trans-Australian Railway. So that's the, that's the, the train that ran again between uh, Port Piri and Kalgoorlie. Um, and we have two carriages off that, uh, off that train. One is a 1930s uh, timber dining carriage. And the other one is a 1952 uh, carriage built in Germany and brought out to Australia um, in 1952 as part of the repatriation of, uh, of Germany. And that's a, a very rare uh, lounge car. So this uh, carriage, as I said, is a 1952 uh, carriage built in Germany and uh, came out to Australia to be part of the uh, special passenger train between uh, Port Pirie and Kalgoorlie. Uh, it, it continued to run until um, the early 1990s before the museum was able to secure it but it's a wonderful very continental European looking carriage and we're so happy to have this as part of our collection. So as I said uh, this is a 1932 timber carriage dining car uh, designed and built at the Port Augusta workshops to operate across the Nullarbor on the Trans-Australian train. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and money in restoring this uh, dining car to create as, as close as we could uh, what it was like to experience a trip in the, uh, the dining car uh, across the Nullarbor and there's a lot of little artifacts and um, memorabilia that's uh, part of the, the carriage itself uh, and it's available for hire if people want to have a special function uh, they can hire this carriage as part of um, their experience uh, at the museum. The dining car itself is very, very uh, large in both height and width. 
which was typical of the carriages that uh, were able to run across the Nullarbor back then because of the uh, no restrictions of uh, heights or widths. So it's a wonderful carriage, beautifully uh, crafted timber, uh, lighting, the ceiling itself. The carriage is almost uh, 10 foot in width and it seats 48 people comfortably for a dinner. Now you can imagine going across the Nullarbor on this train, 60 miles an hour was the speed back then, being served uh, restaurant style food uh, from the dining uh, car kitchen uh, and sitting and enjoying um, company as you went across the Nullarbor. Unbelievable uh, experience I'm sure it must have been for all those people back then. Um, we get people who often want to hire this carriage for their own private function and although we're not involved directly with the catering side of it we allow them to choose whatever caterer they wish to suit their budget and we find it's becoming more and more popular for something completely completely unique to have a, a, a special party or, or a function in this carriage. Just a small selection of the old crockery that was used uh, on the train um, back then. A social community life exhibition and there's uh, some interesting things in here. This display uh, gallery is, is really in recognition of what it was like uh, to be part of the railway family living in remote areas. So a lot of the exhibition is related to circumstances and the working conditions uh, for those families who, who purely because one member of the family would have been involved in the railways either as a track worker or a driver or a fireman, station master. So we've assembled a whole lot of old signage and artifacts, photographs, some uh, stories, anecdotes about um, uh, family life in, in the remote areas. A lot of the uh, doors, a lot of the uh, fittings are, are either uh, very accurate replicas or in fact the uh, genuine articles themselves that's been recovered from various uh, station buildings or locations and, and put into this environment to create uh, what we think is a really good cross section of um, remote family life. If uh, if involved with the railways. Telephone exchange of course was uh, something unique as well before uh, modern communications. Uh, a bit of a um, uh, recognition of the workshops being converted into wartime effort and um, a wonderful uh, tricycle uh, which was a method of transport for various track layers to go from location to location. One of the uh, highlights, particularly for children at the, at the railway museum, is this huge uh, permanent model railway. It's one of the largest uh, permanent model railway setups uh, in Adelaide and it was built by again uh, volunteer uh, model railway enthusiasts and represents a bit of South Australian countryside. There's various scenes uh, depicting bushfires or, or uh, country towns and it's very well laid out and as I said has lots of examples of, um, of different railway scenes around, around the state. Uh, there's quite a, quite a bit of uh, interest in the types of trains that are actually operated on the layout and they are changed over from time to time so uh, any repeat visitation they won't see the same train running the, on each visit. One of the interesting uh, debates when building the modern railway is, is they finally decided that they would create a nighttime storm feel in one of the corners. So a part of the modern railway uh, is this nighttime with, with uh, lightning effects uh, at, a, at a port. So it's not uh, designed after any specific port, but Port Adelaide does, does come to mind. Uh, but the silos, of course, are a little bit further away in, the, in reality. But we think, uh, we just think that the nighttime 
lightning scenes are uh, really worthwhile. The kids certainly love it. Um, we're really uh, pleased to have a facility as large as this, but it is so important because to run this museum and to operate all the trains we do, that's the small ones as well as the full size ones, there's a lot of work to be done and we need the facilities and the room to do it. As you can see, we've got a, a, a selection of uh, what we call 457 millimeter gauge steam and diesel locomotives that all need repairing. There's boiler work, there's bogey uh, work, bearings, there's all sorts of different jobs. Uh, this locomotive we've been working on now for uh, 10 years and this is the one uh, named after Len May. So um, Len will be operating, we hope, down at, to, on the Semaphore Railway uh, by the end of the year and, and it's certainly going to be very impressive to have such a, a large diesel locomotive operating down at uh, Semaphore. Our little favourite uh, blue steam engine, a lot of kids call it Thomas, but, but uh, <coughs> this, this locomotive has been operating at the museum now since we opened in 1988. Again, it was designed and built by the volunteers at the museum and uh, has been operating, as I said, for over 30 years now. And it's certainly a popular, uh, popular exhibit. Carriage repairs, everything is maintained here at the museum uh, because there's there's nowhere to go and buy this stuff. You have to maintain it yourself. Um, manufacturing uh, uh, sleepers as well to, to correct the gauge so they, they're suitable for our own uh, narrow gauge railway. Um, just work everywhere. A, a bogey frame overhaul. Uh, our full size steam locomotive Peron, as I said, it's 101 years old. It's one of the oldest steam locomotives still in in service in Australia and um, and of course Peron the name comes from a World War I uh, battle in, in uh, France um, and again that ties in with our French built steam locomotive we have. Whole array of different machinery that's all needed to um, undertake work at the museum because without the volunteers and without the machinery and facilities um, we can't do anything so it's so important. Originally, the, originally this building was the road motors garage for the railways, so they had a fleet of uh, trucks and vans and vehicles that were all uh, serviced and maintained uh, within this uh, uh, workshop area. So it's, it was almost ready made for us to come and, and uh, for us to use it as our own workshop to keep our uh, locomotive fleet serviced and um, ready, for, uh, ready for the the next lot of work it had to do. People would people would not have any idea the extent of the work that happens in there, but we have to do it. You know, w without a facility like that to keep all the trains maintained, we just can't do it. So it's very important to us. So uh, again, National Railway Museum, look. It's, it's wonderful that, in fact, it's not funded and run by the government, it's run by dedicated volunteers. So that really means so much more to the community and I think that's why we also get a lot of loyal, loyal support, is the fact that we are independent, it's run by volunteers and, and there's no funding that's coming on a regular basis from the government. So it's, it's, it's a great testimony to, uh, to the interest of those people involved. There's a lot of volunteering that's undertaken, uh, particularly in Australia, and from a whole range of different services, for instance, the Mills on Wheels, the firefighting services, um, uh, riding for the disabled. It's not just railway museums. Railway museums is just one small component of the huge voluntary effort that goes into, into looking after the community and also being respectful that sometimes people aren't as fortunate uh, as others. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the second display pavilion is named after uh, uh, Ron Fluck. Uh, he uh, he uh, was the founder of the Railway Museum way back in 1964. Um, 
On my left is the Bud Rail car, uh, again imported from America in the early 1950s. And one of its first jobs was to run a passenger service to the uh, very secretive and developing um, warmer rocket range northwest of uh, Port Augusta. So uh, built, as I said, in America and imported out to do a specific job. And we're so pleased to have that uh, uh, very, very uh, rare uh, piece of American railroad um, passenger travel as, a, as a, an item at the museum. On my right uh, is DE-91. Believe it or not, the American uh, Navy imported uh, four of these uh, to the uh, uh, Sydney Harbour uh, wharf area during World War II to assist with the amount of um, maritime traffic that had to be loaded or unloaded on the docks at Sydney during World War II and the New South Wales Railways just couldn't cope with the amount of extra work so the Americans made sure there was going to be sufficient um, uh, locomotive shunt power and hence where this one came from. Um, made in the USA and uh, uh, it's very important that parts of the history of these uh, items uh, are understood by the visitors so you know we're talking about stuff that's been built in France, in Germany, in Scotland, England, America so again it's a, it's a wonderful collection of different items around the world. So what's really important and the message is if you haven't ever been to the National Rowing Museum or if you have been and you want to come along again, by all means come and bring your family and friends. Uh, this year uh, we have uh, a couple of events already in the pipeline before the end of the year. The first one of those is our annual uh, steampunk festival and steampunks where a lot of uh, people uh, dress up in, in period costume and that represents the, the uh, Industrial Revolution. It's a bit of Doctor Who, it's a bit of uh, Jules Verne. Wonderful uh, costumes and that's really, really good entertainment. That's also when we'll be operating our full-size uh, steam locomotive. And then the, in October, we'll be having a Heritage Transport to Expo where we will have uh, a variety of uh, vintage cars some buses from the 1980s will be here, one of which uh, will be taking people for short trips around Port Adelaide. Uh, we'll have uh, our, our Red Hen rail cars and the Bluebirds running. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we'll have our small steam trains running around the side as well. Uh, hopefully the South Australian Historical Police uh, will have its vehicle collection at the museum. So look, all in all, a couple of great events to still come uh, before the end of the year. So if you can come along, there's always plenty of fun things to do here at the Port Adelaide National Railway Museum. Yeah, so just to recap, the museum's open every day of the week uh, between 10 a.m. and uh, 4 p.m. So I really invite you to come down at any time, uh, any time of the year during those days. Uh, watch us on Facebook and our website because there's all the event information on there. So please come on down.